Well, if you've ever seen a courtroom scene on a TV show, you know that the prosecution's job is to try and get a conviction, to do whatever they can within the bounds of the law to find the defendant guilty. You would love to say that the same thing was true 2,000 years ago, but it wasn't. You see, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, their entire mindset and their goal was to just try and get a conviction, and they would do whatever it takes to have him executed. So why were the Pharisees so upset with Jesus? I really think there are two reasons. One of them is historical. If you look at the Old Testament of the Bible, you'll find that throughout the entire history of Israel, they would consistently follow God for a short period of time, and then they would stop following the rules of God, and they'd fall off the cart. And then a prophet would come along and bring them back on. And the Pharisees had a passion to say, we are going to follow God, and this is going to be the generation that changes that. Well, the problem with that was God was sharing something new about himself. He had brought someone new into the story. He was bringing his son in to die for our sins. And when the Pharisees saw this Jesus, he didn't fit the mold of what they thought it meant to be a follower of God. And so when Jesus came along, there was a second reason. Jesus became very, very popular. And people all over the region fell in love with him, which meant there was some part of their ego that was broken. And so the Pharisees said, this can't stand. So both for historical reasons, and I think personal reasons, they wanted to protect themselves, and they wanted to protect their country. And let me tell you, I know how it feels to want to protect yourself. And I know what it's like to want to protect the organization that you're a part of. But the sad part is when you go to protect yourself and your people and your organization against the movement of God, you'll never find yourself on the right side of the story. You know, one of the difficulties the Pharisees faced, how in the world would they capture Jesus? Jesus was so popular. If they tried to arrest him in the, in the city streets or in the courts, the people would riot. You see, the real danger inside of this is if his popularity rose to the high, a higher level, it's possible the Romans would come in and take their country from them. So what they needed was an inside man. They needed someone who was close to Jesus so they could arrest him when no one else was around. And they found their man, a man named Judas Iscariot, who was a little bit of a greedy man. They offered him 30 pieces of silver, which if you think about it, is quite the bargain. You get an inside track to Jesus, and all it costs is 30 pieces of silver. So after Jesus is arrested, they actually have the trial in the middle of the night, which is another illegal act that the Pharisees move on. Now let me read you what it says in Matthew 26, starting in verse 59. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. But even though they found many who agreed to give false witnesses, they were willing to lie. They could not use anyone's testimony. But finally, two men came forward who declared, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, what do you have to say for yourself? In the last 24 hours, Jesus has experienced immense joys and sorrows. He had what is called the Last Supper with his disciples, where he got an intimate relational environment with them in the last hours of his life. He taught them about humility there, and he spent that evening in relationship with them. And Jesus, after that meal, he would go to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane, where he would agonize over the plan that the Father, Son, and Spirit had put into place in eternity past to redeem broken and sinful mankind. And as he's agonizing in the garden, sweating drops of blood, terrified about the, the future that is in front of him, he asks his friends, pray with me, be with me in this moment, and they fall asleep. After he's done praying, his betrayer shows up with a mob of thugs. They're there to arrest him. They bring him to what it would have amounted to a religious court where they, they, bring, they attempt to bring false accusations, false charges up against Jesus. All the while, he remains silent. I know what it's like to sit in a chair like that, to be the defendant. In 2006, I was arrested for possession of a controlled substance, and I sat in a chair much like this, in a room much like this. As I sat here, my heart raced. As I looked up at a judge who held my freedom in his hands. 
And I looked over and there was, at, at the table across the aisle, there were two attorneys there whose sole purpose was to make an argument for my imprisonment. And they eloquently did so. And everything in me wanted to defend myself. But the reality is, I had nothing to say. Everything they were sharing was true. You see, I had to remain silent because I had nothing to say to advocate for myself. Jesus is innocent. And in this moment, he chooses to remain silent. The Pharisees are trying to get a conviction and all they get is silence from him. Finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, says in a demand, he just, I, I, I imagine him screaming at him. He finally says, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us, are you the Messiah? Are you the son of the living God? And Jesus says the one thing that he knows will turn this mock trial into a bloodthirsty mob. He says, you have said so. Yes, I am the son of God. And I tell you, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds. Jesus, in front of all of these religious Jewish men, claims to be God. And they go crazy. It only fuels their bloodlust. They've got him. This is exactly what the Pharisees needed. They don't need any more witnesses. Jesus just said it himself. He's guilty. And now they've got him. There's just one problem. They don't have the authority to execute. You see, under Roman law, the civil government, all they could do was just try someone. They didn't have the authority to execute, so they have to go above and beyond. They have to go to the authority that Rome has placed over them, which is Pontius Pilate. And so, on a Friday morning, they go to Pontius Pilate and say, we need help. We want this person executed because they want to celebrate the Passover, they want it done quickly. So, Jesus' case came to Pontius Pilate. And the story of history is that Pontius Pilate was sent by a Roman Caesar, Tiberius, and he was exiled, if you will, to this rock pile of a bunch of rebellious people. And so he was here trying to insert his troops, trying to assert his will. And for 10 years, he was the governor of this area. Uh, history says that he was a rather ruthless, ambitious man. In fact, when he first came to be in charge, he marched his legions in, holding the, the picture of the emperor on their standards, which was highly offensive to the Jewish people who believed there should be no images ever, especially not in the holy city of Jerusalem. And so he marched his troops right in there, and they responded with not only rioting, but they encircled his house for five days and he was gonna kill them all, and they said, go ahead and kill us. So he understood he had some problems trying to deal with the Jewish population, but specifically with the Jewish leaders. And so now he gets handed this hot potato where they want him to kill this man that I'm sure he's heard of as a popular teacher in the area. And so he begins to investigate, who is Jesus? And what has he done that might be worthy of death? And so Pilate comes out to them and he says, what are the charges against this man? And they respond with this nonsensical, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And so then he says, well, judge him by your own law. And of course, they bring up the same problem that was already mentioned. But then it says specifically in John chapter 18, it says, this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. And there are little hints like that about how God has this planned from eternity past that the Jewish method of capital punishment was stoning. But the clear prophecies from Psalm 22 and from Isaiah 53 are that Jesus is gonna be pierced and there are specific mentions even before crucifixion was known as a capital punishment. And so it says that the reason that the Jewish people had to come to the Romans was because they were fulfilling prophecy that when Jesus gave his life as the perfect sacrifice, he was gonna be crucified. Even though history clearly paints Pilate as ruthless and ambitious, in the Gospels we have a little more intimate picture of him and maybe some internal questions that are going on and he's really struggling with who is Jesus and what's the right thing to do. And so, in the midst of all of this chaos, he pulls Jesus aside back into his palace and he asks him a couple of questions. He wants to talk to Jesus personally and Jesus talks to him. And Jesus is taken inside the palace He's face to face with one of the most powerful men in the country. And in this tender moment, he reveals some really important truths 
to Pilate. Firstly, he, he, he shares something that Pilate would have understood. In, t- in discussing Jesus' kingship, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You see, he appeals to Pilate, a leader who would understand if you have authority, it means there are people under you. There is no king without a kingdom. There is no leader without followers. And Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, this wouldn't have happened. But it's not of this world. So we know that Pilate's really catching this issue of kingship because Pilate wants to be in charge. And in fact, he's working really hard to make sure that his kingdom is secure. And I've been in that place too, where there are various people wanting different things. And, and when you're in the position of having to make a decision, you realize probably it's not gonna make anybody happy. And, and at one point you wanna do what's right. And the other thing, you just wanna do what's right for me. And I think Pilate's right there. He, he seems to be curious about Jesus and maybe even feels like there's something special about this man. On the other hand, it's really about Pilate maintaining control, not letting the Jewish leaders push him around. It's really about power. So he comes over to Jesus and he asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds to Pilate. He says, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. It's so interesting that in the last hours of Jesus' life, he's concerned with teaching this Gentile uh, who seems to be completely disinterested in his kingdom, in Jesus' kingdom, some deep truths about the kingdom of God. There's this interesting moment where Jesus tells him that his kingdom is not of this world and that everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus. And Pilate is wrestling with that, maybe because partly in Matthew it tells us that his wife had sent him an urgent note saying, have nothing to do with this righteous man. I was greatly troubled in dreams last night because of that. For whatever reason, it seems that that Pilate is wrestling with this, but finally his desire for his own kingship comes up. And he really believes in political expediency. He believes in what it takes to make people obey. He believes in maintaining your power. And so with a deep cynicism, he says, what is truth? It's so interesting that Pilate, the arbiter of truth in this case against Jesus, himself does not believe in truth as he stands there speaking to the way, the truth, and the life. For years, every time Passover comes, the governor has the opportunity and the right to give back a prisoner of their choice. He's trying to make them take back Jesus. They're not gonna do it. This threat is too great. They have to do something, and they have to do something about it now. And so, they'll go to the very crowd that one week earlier was watching Jesus walk through the streets, shouting Hosanna in the highest, this time they're going to get him to chant something far different. So the verdict was guilty and the penalty is death. Jesus' legal trial now ends, and he walks into the greatest trial of his life, the crucifixion. Jesus would have been unrecognizable to the people who know and love him at this moment. After the beatings and the floggings that he's received, he looked more like a bloody mass than a human being. They, would, they gave him a crossbeam for him to carry up to the site of his execution. And along the way, he's so weak probably due to blood loss, that they have to have somebody from the crowd carry the crossbeam for him, a man named Simon of Cyrene. And when they get to uh, the place called the place of the skull, where they would carry out these executions, they would have put the crossbeam together and stretched Jesus out on it, nailing him to the cross. Then they would have hoisted it up so it stood straight in the ground while the weight of his body bared down on the nails. And he hung there for six agonizing hours. But you see, I don't think that the physical pain was the worst part of this suffering, although it was excruciating. I think the worst part is that he who knew no sin became sin for us.
that the weight of the world's sin would now bear down on Jesus and the wrath of God would pour out on Jesus, he would take our penalty. This is where his body is broken for us and this is where his blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus knew that we would forget this moment. He knew that we would forget this moment where our forgiveness comes from and where our freedom comes from. And so 24 hours before this, he set up something to help us remember. He's at a a meal with his friends, the disciples. And as the meal is in progress, he picks up some bread and he says, this is my body. It's broken for you. And then he picks up a cup of some wine and he says, this is my blood is poured out for you. And then he he tells us the whole purpose of this communion that he's instituting. Do this in remembrance of me. You're going to forget. You're going to forget where your freedom comes from. You're going to forget where your forgiveness comes from. You're going to forget where your life comes from. Do this to remember me. Remember my sacrifice. And honestly, uh, for me, communion often becomes a trite ritual. Just something that I do as a Christian. I go to church once a month. We have communion. But I don't see that in Jesus in this moment. He says, my body is broken and my blood is poured out. This is a beautifully brutal reminder of what it costs to forgive sinners. And Jesus knew that we would forget and that we would seek freedom and forgiveness in all the wrong places. And we needed this reminder. As I've been preparing for communion over the last couple of weeks, there's been a passage that's been really helpful to me. From 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 27, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. You see, the Corinthians had messed up the communion. It wasn't so much about remembering Jesus as it was about the wine and getting drunk. And so they weren't remembering Jesus. This wasn't a worshipful moment for them. A couple of years ago, uh, I was at a communion service at the Green Campus of Family Church. And I was on the worship team. And so first service went through. And honestly, that morning, my heart was hard. I was not, I did not want to be there on the worship team. And when it came time for the worship band to have communion, which was between services when we could have it, um, I just took it as this is just something that I do. It was not a remembrance moment. It was not a worshipful moment. And then the next service, my family showed up, and it was a family service, so they were in the auditorium with us, and my wife and son had to leave the auditorium for a moment, so it was just my two little girls in the front row. And I'm on the drums, and they're right there. I can see them. And Pastor Will comes up and he explains what communion is. And I could see their faces begin to light up as they realized they get to remember the sacrifice of Jesus with everybody else, with all of the body of Christ. And then I watched as they got up and got in line to get their communion elements. My oldest daughter passed, her, passed the communion elements to my youngest daughter. And then they went and sat down. And I, my oldest, Amberlyn, she puts her arm around my youngest, Audra. And she said, let's pray. And in this moment where my heart has been hard and I have not taken communion in, a, in an honoring way or a remembering way or a, a way that is worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus, I'm watching my eight-year-old and six-year-old sit there in the front row worshiping God. And I felt so convicted that communion had just become a trite ritual instead of a remembrance of God's sacrifice. And so Paul, here he says, to do this in a worthy manner, and then he gives a specific challenge. Verse 28, he says, Everyone ought to examine themselves, therefore, before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. He says, you need to examine yourself before you take communion. Have a search me, O God, moment. And in a moment, the worship band is going to come up, and we're going we're gonna to have a, a song that's going to lead us in communion. But before we take the elements, I want to give us the same challenge that, that, that Paul gave the Corinthian church. If we're going to take communion in a worthy manner, we need to have a moment where we're examining our hearts before the Lord. So 
I don't know where, where you're at right now. Maybe you're in your car. If you're in your car, I want you to pull the car over. If, it's, if you're at the office, I want you to take a five-minute break. If you're at home and the littles are running around you, I want you to give them a snack and get five minutes in the bathroom. Wherever you're at, I want you to quiet the noise because often God speaks in a still, small voice. And the noise of the world can drown out the voice of God. And I want you to take this moment to just be real before God. Allow Him to show you blindness in your life. Allow Him to bring brokenness to the surface. Allow Him to show you where there's sin that needs to be dealt with or there's bondage that you need to be freed from. And then as you have those things that the Lord brings to your mind, that's not a to-do list. You don't have power over those things. That's something that you give to God. You trust Him for your freedom in those areas. I want to challenge us to examine ourselves before we take this act of communion. And remember the beautiful and brutal sacrifice of Jesus. So I, I invite you to join us as family church across Douglas County and across the globe remembers the sacrifice of Jesus.